So, dear friends, isn't it amazing that the New Testament begins with a humble carpenter to whom this great revelation was given. Now, if you know all epic writers, those that wrote the great epics, they want to enter the story at a great moment, at a climactic moment. Now, would you think that a carpenter, a, an ordinary man who lived most humbly would be the person to start off the Christmas story. And the angel brought the message to this troubled man. Well, we live in troubled times, at least we trouble ourselves, don't we? With our thoughts and our fears. We trouble ourselves, we trouble those around us, we trouble our families, and so on and so forth. So, what was this moment at which God's revelation came to Joseph? 19th verse, Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly, privately. What? What a perplexity and what a moment of distress this must have been. See, I have been deceived by this young woman. I don't think there would be a harder thought to endure for any righteous young man. But in the world in which we live today, this seems to be a very common experience to many people. They count on somebody to be very faithful and suddenly discover the person is far from faithful. And as to what such a revelation must mean to any righteous, right-living person, I cannot imagine. Certainly it would be one of the hardest things. So we find a young man at what you would consider to be almost the lowest point in his life. And the lowest point was going to be turned into the greatest point in history. It was not just a personal story here. And God does that miracle, the lowest point, becoming the most glorious, the most momentous point, revolutionary point. Indeed, it was a very revolutionary point in this young man's life because everything changed from this point. Everything. 
his whole status he was but a humble carpenter probably he didn't think that anybody would notice him but he is thrust upon history upon eternity as a key figure and joseph who was espoused to mary being a just man and not willing to make her a public example you know the thing called here various horrible emotions come into play one is jealousy another is anger and a third is revenge what shall i do to get my own back upon this situation this girl having served me in this fashion what shall i do but look at the very different reaction of this young man he did not want this thing to smear the character of mary this is a very questionable happening and in fact it was forbidden by the law and it carried a death penalty with it at that time for conduct of this nature amongst god's people israel yet this young man is so protective just think of that one of the normal things that we do when we are put to into a tight corner is to gather some sympathizers see we must take up the phone or something and ring somebody and pour that garbage into their ears and then when they say fine we think you are right oh we feel highly comforted and if that person appears to disagree with your thinking you put that that receiver down and you go to another person you want to hear get the message you know get your own back your vengeance you know that spirit of vengefulness the spirit of jealousy and along with it the spirit of vengefulness you see because somehow i was spared this kind of conduct or such emotions in my life i have not thought very much about them because personally i didn't have to fight them never did by the grace of god these may be very normal and natural happenings in many people's personal life jealousy and followed by a vengeful conduct you know the underdogs anger somehow that is a very tr- awful thing and yet we don't see it in this young man joseph he did not 
want to make her a public example. Yet it is quite a public matter when a virgin brings forth a child or is found with child. It's a pretty public matter. And how do you try to protect such a matter? Look at the noble heights to which this young man rises. He did not want to make her a public example, but was minded to put her away, Hababa, secretly. He wanted the whole thing to be low-key. This is not for the public. This is not for slander. This is not for people to gossip. I don't want this gossip gallery all agog. You know, the gossip galleries are in, to be found in many churches. Many families, gossip galleries, where people just gossip, rubbish. You know, I never had a stomach for gossip. Isn't reality hard enough to encounter and face? The real battles of life, should we get a lot of garbage with which we have to struggle? Which are not our business, in fact. I say that's not my business. I don't want to enter into that matter. Let people learn to fight their own battles. If they want prayer help, yes, I'll give it. But I will not enter into gossip and things like that. You know, had I gotten into those things in my life, I would have accomplished nothing. That's it. That would have been the end of me. I wanted to face the real challenges, the real issues, the big picture. I can't understand how a small carpenter's mind could even conceive such a big picture. He was made a central figure in the biggest picture of history. You see, if you're suddenly thrown into a role like that from being a simple, private, ordinary person, how would you react? Probably you would react with great pride. See, I am the selected one. I am the unique person. Do we see a shade of that feeling in him? No. We simply don't see anything like that. He came in incognito, he thought, and he remained as incognito as he could be, behind the scene, withdrawing, silent, not speaking up or blowing his own trumpet, as the phrase goes. No. You know, if we achieve some little thing, we like everybody to recognize that. We like everybody to say something very pleasant or pleasing about it, a comm commending us. We like a back pat. Let's face it. Did he look for anybody to pat his back? No. He did not seek 
some confidence, solace, comfort in the sorest trial of his life. Now that speaks of faith in God. He didn't go to somebody, what do you say to this? Now, what shall I do now? Nothing of the sort. Till the angel came to him, his perplexity and questions were not solved. Looking for the revelation of God, waiting for the revelation from God. That is quite another matter. You know, we like to come to our own conclusions, and very often our conclusions are wrong because our premises are wrong. You see, our knowledge is so limited. We don't see the big picture. We only see the little picture and cringe and, you know, what else to cry and mull over it. Only the small picture. The big picture must come by revelation from God. And when the big picture came, you see, while he 20, verse 20, and while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David. I wonder if he had ever thought of himself as such a chosen son of a royal lineage. Fear not to take unto you Mary, your wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Mind-blowing words. How do you understand such words? Never happened in history. He never <laughs> had he ever seen a book of signs. Certainly he wouldn't have read anything like this there. And think of it. Confronted by a message like this, a mind-blowing message. And his... A small, limited knowledge, whatever he had in that tiny town where he lived. All right, look at his mind. He just embraced the revelation. We fight the revelation very often. We are disinclined to accept the Word of God. You see, we dither, we procrastinate, we put it off. We don't understand the big picture. We think our small picture is superior to the big picture. It is never so. How can my small mind ever measure up or come anywhere close to the big picture which God has got? Now, isn't that terrible when, and very presumptuous, not to speak of pride, for us to imagine, oh, I'm right. You know, this is how I think. You see, this is how I see the picture. No, it's not as you see the picture. 
It is as God sees the picture. And what does God say about the picture? All right, you make a your portrait or a drawing of some sort, an artistic work, let's call it, and then do you say I judge this to be the best picture in the world? Is there anybody so stupid to think so? You want the art critics. You want the people who know the subject. What do you think of this attempt of mine? Is it worth anything or is it to be trashed? We don't have that humility very often. We think our picture is the only picture. It is not. God's picture was completely different. And when he was admitted into that big picture, look at his willingness to just receive it. Twenty-fourth verse. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, taking up such a responsibility. Today we see a lot of failure in fatherhood. Somehow, we many people seem to think of fatherhood as supplying them a little money for the upkeep of the family. That's all they think of. I'm afraid there's a great temptation to think that way. But, Think of the spiritual protection. The feeling of security that must come to a family from a father. The assurance. I think most of our troubles today in the world is lies in this. Failure of fatherhood. Irresponsibility in fatherhood. And of course, motherhood. Now, what kind of shield is he going to be? What kind of protector is he going to be? What kind of influence is he going to be upon the Son of God? Let's pray. Loving Father, we keep us from Christmas blues. The devil would like to send this disease upon the whole country and the whole world. As a matter of fact, everybody seems to be glum and gloomy and blue. They're all troubled, fearful. Oh, my Father, and here is your voice telling us afresh, fear not. Save us, we pray you, and put us in the narrow way, put us in the stream, in the straight path that we may not miss your great blessings. We thank you, Lord. All that we shall ever need is in Jesus, our precious Savior. In Jesus' name, amen.